in the United States, uh, CANAF is being used to make products that are used in the oil and gas industry for cleaning up oil and gas spills, both on land and water. Welcome to Sustainability Now, an exploration of technologies and paradigms to shape a world that works. Designed for socially conscious entrepreneurs and individuals interested in responsible stewardship of the planet. Sustainability Now covers food, energy, housing, water, waste, health, economics, and consciousness. Welcome to your community, Sustainability Now, with your host, Mira Rubin. Welcome, everybody, to Sustainability Now, Technologies and Paradigms to Shape a World that Works. I'm your host, Mira Rubin, and I am very excited to introduce Bob Larson to you today, visionary guru, renaissance man, and founder of Canaf Partners USA. And uh, you probably don't even know what Canaf is. I didn't. And we're here to introduce it and talk about why it's such a special thing. And we'll just have fun together and learn all about how we can help shape a new agricultural economy. So with that, Bob, welcome. Thank you, Mara. I'm really glad to have you here. Yeah, Thanks. it's great. Huh? You're Tell good. It smile and, <laughs> and a very positive attitude and the wonderful things you're doing just uh, excites me even more. Oh, thanks so much. Hey, tell us what CANAF is. CANAF is a plant, that, an annual plant that uh, is in the hibiscus family. And uh, it can grow from six foot to 18 foot tall in a single season. And that has, uh, over 25,000 different uses, very similar to industrial hemp. Some things that can do better, or there are companies that say do better in certain things with CANAF, and uh, industrial hemp can do other things that are better than CANAF. The one thing that we don't do the same is industrial hemp has the CBD and CBG oils and stuff, and CANAF is more of a fiber, wood, and seed crop. Okay, great. So I know that people, there's been such a huge trend of uh, enthusiasm for industrial hemp and for cannabis, and it's very much in the news, and people are more and more aware of it, the benefits of it to the land, how it helps to sequester carbon, and uh, in addition to the benefits of CBD and all of that. Uh, but we haven't really heard much about CANAF. And it sounds like they're comparable in many ways outside of the CBD aspect, which is not a minor detail. But what about CANAF would make it a benefit right now versus planting industrial hemp? Well, I really don't want to say one's better than the other because you can actually grow them very close to each other without cross-pollination problems. Okay. Fact, some of my customers are uh, industrial hemp growers too. And let's say, for example, um, looking at industrial hemp as a fiber and wood crop and the seed or CBD oils at the same time, along with uh, CANAF as a fiber and wood product, and looking at those markets that the individual grower can serve in their own communities. I mean, there's so many possibilities depending on the community and, and so on and so forth. Why would you want to plant both? Well, some guys want to, they have all invested already in the seeds and the genetics and the seeds for industrial hemp, all of the expensive equipment for extraction and, and processing the oils for CBD and so forth. And they're not going to just throw that away or sell it or anything. They want to keep that going. But what happens if they test too high for THC? That bars their crops from uh, being used for that. Well, what do you use as a backup? 
Well, as a backup plan, if you're looking at a fiber and wood industry, which the plan also does, and you can have CANAF without the restrictions and the permits and having the interstate commerce difficulties on going from one state that's okay with it, and another state that's not, you have a backup plan that's very inexpensive that can be done with what one's already doing. You know, I think you also have an entry plan because you brought up a really good point, and that is that cannabis uh, and industrial hemp production is not legal in all states, and there are certain legal complications, and and I'm sure, as you're saying, it's more expensive to produce a cannabis product than it is to produce Canaf at this point. So it's almost like Canaf could be a gateway to uh, cannabis production, right? If, yeah. if people wanted to migrate to that eventually when the laws change. Yeah, the door is open to many more people because the cost to get involved. For example, I sell 100 Canaf seeds for and delivered with a tracking number for $7.99. Most people can afford that. And in three years, those 100 seeds can turn into enough seed to plant 40 acres and have tons of seed and tons of fiber and wood. So they don't, that's their initial investment, basically. They have the land, a little bit of hard work, and uh, so on and so forth, and they have a crop that has value to it. I love the idea of 100 seeds. I see a whole marketing campaign on based on 100 seeds as you're saying that but i'm wondering how how do you tend those 100 seeds that it turns into enough to seed such a large farm well my focus has been on uh testing uh various varieties we've tested 19 so far and three of them uh we have that i sell those are uh, early and medium maturing canaf, one early and one medium, which means we can grow canaf and harvest seed in any state in the U.S. So when you're saying early and medium growing, what does that mean? Canaf is photosensitive, so it responds to sunlight and the amount of hours. There's a 12 and a half hours. And as you move from the north to the south, the angle from, of the sun hits those places differently. So you have different hours and seasons. Okay. And some, some varieties require more days, like early requires 60 uh, to 70 days to mature, where it forms a flower, starts producing seed pods, and then uh, you harvest the pods and you have your seeds. And then medium is like 70 to 90 days to maturity. And then uh, late maturing is 120 days. Okay, so you're talking about harvesting seed from these plants. But then what about the, in the same time frame, are they harvestable as wood and fiber also? Or does, how long a season do they take for that? Yes, uh, yeah, they can grow, yeah. The seeds take the longest. When they oh, okay. mature, they're pretty much done growing, and all the energy in the uh, the plant needs is goes into flowers and seed production. Okay. Kind of like a tree, you know, like a cherry tree. You know, you'll start out with flowers, and the and it starts growing buds early, but it has an early season harvest. Um, but the leaves come before that, and so on and so forth. Well, and so you said that. Like hemp, CANAF has 25,000 different uses. I don't know if most of the public is aware even that cannabis has that many uses and what the benefits are of both these plant families to the soil and to our environment. And maybe you could give us some examples and, and possibly some examples of how CANAF is currently being used industrially. Okay, both, uh, both plants sequester carbon during its growing process, more so than uh, nearly any other plant or tree. So uh, 
that's one of the benefits there. Both of them also uh, will take up toxins in the soil, including heavy metals and remove them. So uh, specialized industries are forming up just around that, having to do with phyto remediation, which using phyto or plants that interact with sunlight to remediate soil, take up the toxins and so forth. And so the examples are like uh, in the United States, uh, CANAF is being used to make products that are used in the oil and gas industry for cleaning up oil and gas fills, both on land and water. But that same company also is smart and they have mats that they uh, manufacture with the fibers for erosion control. And major freeways that have the slopes, you know, especially under the overpasses, well, that's susceptible to erosion, which is a problem for the foundation of the cement structure of the overpass, yeah. as well as other things. So when they roll out those mats, the soil can't go anywhere, and they can actually plant those mats or embed seeds and into those mats and grow things. There. That's brilliant. I had no idea. I, I've heard of being um, of utilizing hemp, and I imagine Kanaf for creating paints and uh, plastics, even and uh, fillers and upholstery fillers and things like that, and building materials. Now, one of the things that I'm actually really aware of is uh, hempcrete, and I understand that you can make Kanafcrete. Yeah. The properties between the two wood cores are very similar. And so uh, I believe it's been done. Uh, and we like to, I like to think of taking it one step further and not just building homes with hempcrete or canapcrete, but also using bamboo as a structural uh, part that's sustainable rather than harvesting our trees. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the, the benefits of a material like hempcrete or canafcrete are legion. Uh, it's porous in terms of air quality. It, it moves air. It, go, you say, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, both of them actually are mold-proof, fire-proof, uh, pest-proof, water-proof. They have the self-healing qualities if they get water, you poke a hole in them or something. And they sequester more carbon than any other known substance today. And, and they get stronger over time, right? It continues doing it over time. It's remarkable. And the soundproofing and the, yeah, it could last hundreds and hundreds of years. Hi, this is Scott, co-founder of Sustainability Now. I wanted to remind you that resources and links related to this episode can be found on our website, sustainabilitynow.global. While you're there, consider signing up for a monthly membership to help us keep the show going. This year, we will be adding live events, long-form reporting, and interactive content. We started Sustainability Now as a passion project, and until this point, we've been completely self-funded. Your contribution will ensure that we can continue to build community, inspire hope, and share solutions. Thanks, and remember that together, we can shape a world that works. So we have, we have short season, we have ecologically beneficial, and in terms of actually farming uh, canaf, what are the benefits of farming it, uh, not only to the soil, but otherwise? The ease of it. Yeah, I, I left one thing out on hempcrete or canafcrete. The insulation value, which is very important in hot and cold climates. Um, I know other natural building materials such as cotton, they're building homes out of. And I was looking at the fires that were in California last year, and there were cob houses. Oh. People, people had to evacuate them because they transfer the heat, and inside it becomes a very hot oven. Canaf and hempcrete have been tested with 1200 degree Fahrenheit torches where it, you can't feel anything after hours. 
that's remarkable. And it just doesn't burn it, either. It, if you got trapped in a home, can have for emptied home. If you were sealed off from the smoke and had enough oxygen, you could survive a forest fire perhaps around you. Oh, that's a that's an interesting concept. Very interesting. It's a remarkable material. I mean, I'm familiar with it as hemp, but with Kenaf being similar in property, that's remarkable. Yes. Okay, to answer your question about farmers. Um, my focus, uh, you know, I really, I'm really interested in helping restore the Mississippi watershed and other watersheds as well. But the Mississippi and the United States embraces 37 states and two Canadian provinces. It is right down the middle of the Midwest, the Corn Belt, the corn and soy, and so on and so forth. Which and is big, big GMO territory. Yes, and there's many problems with the Mississippi River, you know, with uh, erosion from the surrounding states and all the pesticides, herbicides, and glyphosate. Yeah, and even the uh, fertilizers, you know, we get the blooms and things that go right down the Mississippi out in Louisiana, where they have a six, seven mile or, and growing dead zone where nothing can live in that part of the ocean. To me, that's the real test on whether or not this works. Getting enough corn and soy and cotton farmers, you know, using CANAF and industrial hemp as a rotational cash crop, starting out small and growing from there, can reduce the pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides because you don't need that. The most you would need in some cases is a pre-emergent weed control for, for CANAF. They're drought tolerant. You could save money on water and, and pesticides, fungicides, and seeds for sure. So you're, looking, you're looking at financial benefit and you're looking at a big environmental benefit too. Yes. Yeah. It has many, many, many functions. We used to be challenged in our permaculture design class by Kareem Brennan, our instructor, to think of as many functions for any one element in your design. I love and, that. Yeah, and it was just, uh, you know, it stretches the mind and gets you to think. And if you do that, you're actually, uh, put one thing in there and it does many things for you. And if it's working with nature, it's like, well, the work, nature is doing the work for you. It's really smart to hire those guys because they know what they're doing too. Well, I would like you to say a little bit about the origins of CANEF Partners USA, um, just so that people have a bit of an orientation where you came from. And I'm just gonna do a little disclaimer here. Bob has a very rich past with all kinds of experiences that would fill multitudes of other podcasts, but we're just going to focus right now on this particular venture, which you brought a lot of entrepreneurial skill to. And a number of our audience members are visionary entrepreneurs, and I think that you epitomize that category. And if you could just talk about what you saw as an opportunity and how you evolved your business from it. That was very nice to say, thank you. Um, I started out because I didn't never heard of CANAF either, uh, what, four or five years ago. And I was looking at industrial hemp in the same way I'm looking at CANAF now. And at that time, uh, a letter from our commissioner in the state of Michigan were saying that they were looking at, uh, they were, you could apply for permits, but only, uh, universities or uh, institutions could do a small amount of growing for research purposes only. Right. And, you know, to further that, they, they said they had to figure out how to regulate it. Well, that's putting the cart before the horse. And I said, I know red tape and it just acts as a stop. If I was to go into business doing that, I would have to be willing to go with the big guns and try to overcome the stops. 
And I said, there's probably a better way to go about this. And so I found out about Canal and I found out it's not regulated. And I found out like many things about it and that it could actually re fill in that uh, desire to use industrial hemp to do all the things I was looking at. And that's how it got started. And so tell us a little bit about what your business is actually. You said you have customers and I'm, I'm guessing that you're not making your living selling 100 seed packets at $7.99. So what, what is your business exactly with Kenef? Well, what I do, do, I do is um, uh, I sell this introductory seeds. I also had, we released two books last year, the authors and illustrators, Mary and Richard Rensberry, uh, produced our first book, uh, Canaf Seeds for Life. And that's uh, available both on paperback and digital. And I, I, just for everyone listening, I want you to know that we will provide links to access these books or to be able to purchase these books on our website, which is sustainabilitynow.global. That's .global instead of .com. Great. And the other and, book? And the other book is called Can Have Seeding the World, and it has to do with uh, introducing it to farmers. And that one was uh, translated by one of our partners, Elizabeth Simonetti, into French. And she works with the Catholic missionaries over in Togo, Africa. Wow. So that 200 of those books went out to the farmers there. They've got some canaf seed and they're starting. Which I was trying to contain this in the United States, but we already have 50 pounds of seed that recently went to the orphan, orphanage, uh, girls' orphanage in Haiti. And we have canaf going to a, a a big uh, cassava grower in Kenya and then farmers in Nigeria. So where uh, do you help as a brokerage of sorts to uh, help people that have the crop find people that want to buy the, the crop or businesses that want to buy it or utilize it? Yes, I, I have a website that I handle myself and it's uh, kind of like a hub for that. People uh, can go in there and uh, submit what they're looking for, who they want to connect up with. And it, I check the, every morning uh, before the sun comes up, I check the submissions for that. And those that have to do with canal uh, or industrial hemp or processing because we're working together, um, gets approved and it goes up on the blog and then it gets all of my, all of the followers on the RSS feed or the Yahoo feed, um, get notified that something new came up. This is really a passion project for you in a lot of ways, isn't it? Yeah, it's my legacy. I want to, you know, I figure, Bob, you, you, you learned all these things. You worked hard. Uh, let's put it to good use and share it with others. And, and that can be your legacy to a better world. Because the truth is, you told me that you really don't have to work. So this doesn't have to be a revenue generating thing for you directly. You're, you're doing it because you are wanting to create a legacy. That's right. I could do my art and go fishing all the time and have fun, you know. But instead, you're changing the world through Kanaf. Yes. Will I you give us, give us your website URL? It's HTTPS colon forward slash slash canaf k e n a f partners p a r t n e r s u s a dot com and we will have a link to that also on our website at sustainabilitynow.global but i interrupted you what were you going to say do you remember no okay you were talking about it being a passion project and leaving a legacy yeah okay so i yeah, I do. I was going to say, uh, I do do make time to go fishing from time to time. <laughs> okay. Great. So uh, I took a look at your website and I see that you are a proponent of regenerative agriculture. And I have a question about that because my understanding is that monoculture 
agriculture is one of the reasons that we're having challenges that we're having. So even if we have rotational crops that are big swaths of the same plant, isn't that problematic? If you look at it from the small picture, let me share the big one with you. Okay, so we have this huge uh, commercial agriculture going on in the United States and around the world. Corn, soy, and cotton. You can throw in wheat and some other ones. Uh, can I interrupt you for one question, uh, for a question? Is CANAF a, a feedstock also? For animals? Yeah, could it be? Yes, except for horses. I would be cautious because it has high protein content and that is not necessarily good for horses. Okay, so it could, it could replace the feedstock uh, needs that were met by soy and corn. I don't think it would replace that. Okay. Um, for example, cows. Uh, when you, I worked on dairy farms before, so I know you, you get, you feed cows corn silage or corn and minerals for their diet that produces energy and that produces quantities of milk. But you have to have enough hay because cows have four stomachs. And if you don't give them hay, their stomachs turn and then you have to call the veterinarian and then you have problems and stuff. And also pushing high uh, milk production can cause a common uh, form of mastitis where the milk hardens up in the udder and then they have to be treated with antibiotics. Yeah. And you exactly. can't, and you lose the milk. Yeah. So you want to keep a good balance there. Um, you know, it is not something that can replace feed or fodder for any form of animal. Animals don't, you know, if you look at animals in the wild, what would they do? Well, let's, in this case, then what you're saying is that it's used primarily for its fiber uh, and the other 25, uh, 2400, uh, 24,999 or whatever uses, not fodder so much. Well, it does. It, you can use it for fodder. I mean, chickens, uh, Kareen down in Brooksville, Florida, uh, on her 10 acre farm, her chickens love it. I said, okay. I mean, Love to see the smile on your chickens' faces. <laughs> I'm picturing that. But let's let's get back to my earlier question. I derailed you. I apologize. We were talking about monoculture, and you said, "Well, let's look at the bigger picture." Yes. Okay. You have to look at the existing scene as it is today. With you take a look at a corn corn and uh, soy farmers, they usually rotate those two crops. Uh, cotton farmers normally stay with cotton. And all those things torture the soil. Okay. Right? Yeah, yeah. But you look at them, you got to look at them and their business and what their challenges are. They've been doing the same thing for so many years. To change anything is a hard choice for them, mm -hmm. you know, because they have survived. So you want, with most I mean, you have a farmer that won't change. You'll have farmers that might change with a hundred seeds in their backyard or something, in addition to not changing anything else. Or you can have farmers that may want to introduce a couple of our, the six protocols that I address on my website for in, re, towards regenerative farming which you just introduced a new word, which I was gonna get around to, and it's actually really exciting, this notion of regenerative farming. So can you just explain to people what that is? Yeah, if you take a look at nature, uh, a forest in nature, it takes care of itself. It regenerates each other. Do you have the, all the diversity and the um, symbiotic activity amongst the species there? animals, microbes, and trees, and plants, and bushes, and weeds, and so forth, uh, they all work together. They all provide a resource or food for others, and that's a whole cycle. 
so that it regenerates itself. You don't have to do anything with it. So uh, corn, soy, cotton, and canaf are not in themselves a regenerative. But we want to get the farmers to regenerative. But you, what said, is you, you said canaf is one of those. You said canaf is not regenerative? Not in itself. There is no single plant that's regenerative right. amongst it itself. Okay. Even can, though canaf contributes to the soil while the others deplete the soil. There, there's, a, there's a balance, a give and take amongst the soil and the plants. Yes. The plants uptake uh, in, uh, nutrients and the ones that they don't use, they send back down in the soil. Some of them don't do that. Right. Very, you know, and, and what they send back down into the soil, some of them, such as evergreen trees, um, are causes acidic pH, which prevents many species of other plants from growing in them area. So they have kind of an invasive thing. But that can be, uh, there's also plants that work well with evergreen, such as blueberries. So yeah, when you introduce blueberries to say evergreen stand or something, you're uh, going in the direction of more regenerative because you're introducing diversity and so forth. So getting back to this big picture, you have various farmers and various states of mind in businesses in the soy, corn, and cotton industry. And looking at CANAF as a, a, as a very low entry point and the other five protocols and the protocols that would you, are- Would you go through the protocols just real quickly? Yes, the one I, I recommend no matter what is soil testing and not by your local extension office because they only do, uh, they don't do a complete soil test from my point of view. Okay. I recommend a company called Logan Lags, Labs. They uh, do a complete soil test. And one of the things I like about them is your soil test comes back tells you, lists all the nutrients and the minerals and trace elements and, and that you need in the soil and tells you how much you got. So you know how many, um, how much of what to be added to have it complete. Mm -hmm. And they even have resources where you can get those things. And cool. then I, I have another company that will especially when uh, large corn farmers and, or large commercial farmers want get involved, they can have their soil tested and the report emailed to company uh, down in uh, Brooksville, Florida, who will manufacture a natural liquid mix wow. just for their soil. So maybe you'll give us those resources and we'll post them on the website at sustainabilitynow.global. They are on they are on my uh, website with the okay. recommended protocols. Cool. The other ones are simple things that we can start out with corn farmers. You know, if the corn farmer is told that he needs to buy X number of seed by a seed salesman and plant his corn three and four inches apart and the rows four inches apart, uh, we're going to tell him proper seed spacing, seven inches apart both ways is better because it causes less stress. If you cause stress on a plant, it will send out signals to tell the pest to come and eat it. And other things will see, uh, you know, uh, bacteria and different things will see it's stressed out and vulnerable and it should do something about it. We, can, we forget that plants are living things that respond to environment. Yeah. Yeah. So just proper plant spacing. Okay. Reduces stress and the input costs and the bottom line. A better, higher yields and more profit for the farmer. Other ones are, let's say, for example, there are farmers that have different parts of their fields that are they can't grow anything on. Why? Because it's too dry or it's too wet. And the normal operation for these farmers 
<coughs> is to put in a drainette tile system, which is very expensive. It's made out of plastic, it's below the surface. And when it rains, instead of puddling up, it goes into the drains and goes out into a ditch area off the out of the field. That's land that could have been used for actually growing. So it only handles flooding. It doesn't handle drought. Key line plowing, when done on contour, works with the way the water flows through the landscape when it rains. And by letting the water seep down into the soil, capturing it before it gets to the point of puddling, you're storing water in the landscape. Yep, and replenishing the aquifer. Yes, and it handles both drought and flooding situations. So key line plowing is another way to go. It's a subsoiler that builds soil from the bottom up and it can help. I don't recommend it in every case. And it's uh, those that uh, farmers that have clay and compacted soil from driving big tractors over them, they can benefit from this. Better soil, better yield, and less stress and so forth. And better, healthier planet, healthier people. Yes, yes. <clears throat> so were there, were there any other uh, of the points that were the strategies for, you, you named plant spacing, key line tilling. Um, um, Soil testing. Soil testing. And, and proper uh, amendments added to that. I know that you have a commitment to regenerative farming. And I noticed that there's some kind of affiliation with the Indigo Carbon Project. Did I speak that properly? Yeah, there's not. It's one I was putting out there as a an additional thing for uh, farmers. Right okay. now, in, in, in order, the carbon credits are associated with certain approved crops. So let's, and, let's and, just talk and, about, let's and, just talk about what Indigo does and, and um, what, what the carbon pre credit thing is first. Like, let's lay a foundation for it. Well, they first of all have their technology on testing carbon before and after. And they, uh, uh, once you are approved with one of the crops that they, they approve that are certified for carbon credits, you can actually uh, apply and they will pay you in advance for growing on your acre. So much, $15 I think per ton per acre. So if CANAF can uh, sequester 10 tons of carbon per acre, that's $150 per acre extra just for growing it there, not including the other, the other stuff. With, with no product that has to be delivered, it's just for growing. Right. That's awesome. That's yeah, that's an amazing thing. Yeah, no, CANAF is not certified yet, not on the list of one of those but it's getting people that I'm, I'm working, looking at the future and the trends and I'm putting things there because the more people that know about it now, if they look at that in terms of their future business plan, they sure. can be prepared for that when the time comes. I, I took some notes here. I'm just scrolling through to find uh, a little bit. There's a, in coordination with the Indigo, Car Indigo Carbon Program, and we're going to provide links for both of these uh, as well. There's an initiative called the Terraton Initiative, and it's sort of a play on words because T-E-R-A means one trillion, and T-E-R-R-A is Latin for Earth. And their commitment is to remove one trillion tons of carbon dioxide uh, from the world's 12 billion acres, using the world's 12 billion acres of farmland. And it looks like you've partnered up with them or are laying the groundwork for that so that CANAF can be a big part of that future, yes? Well, whether we partner up with them or not, it's we are in alignment. We are contributing to that motion. 
Yes. And it also tells people where the big money is and where the focus is. Yeah. And it substantiates any decisions they make to get involved in the CANAF industry chain, uh, supply chain. Yeah. Now you were you were talking about the big picture of monoculture on the way to regenerative agriculture, and you were talking about CANAF offers an opportunity to migrate people into something, farmers into something that is more sustainable. And then, then I am imagining that there are a number of steps to follow to actually get to where we're doing regenerative agriculture. Do you want to talk into that a bit? Yeah, let's go back to the protocols because uh, that's where you start. Yeah, the idea of no-till is not breaking the service or disturbing the soil. Uh, you don't want to do that because of the microorganisms that are already established there. You break up their networks of communication and it's like, that's where their families are and their relatives and you come in there and you tumble it all up and you know their families are like in the next state now and where are the kids you know <laughs> you know i think i think that that might be one of the most revolutionary aspects of regenerative farming because it requires a, a complete re-education a paradigm shift uh because that's how farming's been done for a long time. And, and I, I think it's just probably a foundational belief that that's how you farm, you till the land. That's so, right. Yeah, and I, I know farmer, there are, I know of certain farmers that just love to be in their tractors. Yeah. And, and, and an excuse to get out there and till, yeah. is, you know, to, it's almost, well, how do you withdraw from that, you know? Right. And it is a challenge. I know where these guys are coming from. I, you know, I see it. And so, um, I, so I, w I was describing, you know, um, farmers, the, you know, like the guys that won't change or very little change or some will do a little more. But then you got guys like Gabe Brown, who's a wild experiment. He He's noted for trying all kinds of stuff and he is very much into he's one of my mentors i respect this guy uh, with the diverse cover crops we didn't cover that much right but taking a look at canaf in relationship to this whole thing there are individuals that are going to be able to jump in like uh, Gabe Brown and do all six protocols, do diverse crops, not have a need even for canaf, but they are starting to regenerate, be into regenerative farming. Yeah. There, there are some farmers that are starting small um, and applying the things that are taught with by Mark Shepard with regenerative agriculture and woody perennial polycrops in cahoots with uh, the University of Illinois. Uh, and, and some others. Those techniques are very cost, costly and your, re, your yield is not for two or more years down the road. So if current farmers cannot wait for that. So how do you get from where the farmer is to regenerative farming? And that's what I am talking about Canaf. CANAF is an opportunity for farmers, most any farmer, except ones that just won't change, to actually do something with that is no low risk. What's eight bucks, you know what I mean? Uh, eight bucks, start and then look at it. Spend a few minutes while you're out on your tractor doing the usual and how you're going to do your business with CANAF two, three years down the road. What are you going? What where are you going to get your forty acres? Which one of your fields is it going to be? Multiple fields, these kind of things. But getting them started on it now and thinking about it, they will pre be prepared down the road. While I and others work in the background, getting funding and work processing centers ready to take care of their raw stocks for fiber and wood, and 
and create the interest and demand for the seeds that they'll have. I, I want to ask you about the interface of regenerative agriculture and permaculture. The what phase? The interface, like where do where does permaculture meet regenerative agriculture? Well, the concept of regeneration is diversity. You know, doing what nature or following, learning what nature does, and working with it. Regenerative uh, agriculture does that, and so does permaculture. That's where they meet. It's it's how do you work with nature? Okay, but they're, they're, they're not integrated per se. They just have, they have their different approaches with the same intent well, or similar intent. Yes. Yeah. So let's say, for example, well, you wouldn't take a, a, a corn or soy or cotton farmer and suggest that he plant a food forest with seven layers. Okay. Not right away. Not right away. But if I told them to start out with uh, 100 canaf seeds and start thinking about the future here, you know, of canaf as a rotational crop for your corn and soy, and, and start following some of these other protocols, uh, and let me know how it goes, and we'll talk later. You okay. know, I, I befriend him, you know, and um, I, I feel my job, you know, at Canaf Partners USA is to help each individual be successful in the canaf supply chain whatever whatever hat they put on and decide to go with that's what i want to help them with i understand it, i understand that one of the challenges with cannabis and and industrial hemp is separating the fiber from the herd is that is it the herd and the fiber am i yes. right there yeah the technical term is called decortication the equipment referred to are called decorticators and uh, they separate the fiber from the wood yes and we, so um as far as equipment for that that's that is uh in rare supply in this in this country at this moment i believe is that true like there aren't really many decortication facilities around yes that's correct yeah decorticators come in uh small medium and large sizes uh there are two uh, three processing centers that i know of in the united states one is in colorado one is in north uh west mississippi and one in north carolina with one in North Carolina plans to be in about four or five other states uh, they're looking into. And uh, that's, these are large ones, uh, what we would consider large ones. So a small decorticator would go for about $2,500. Um, medium ones starting at 10 grand and going up. And the big ones start at one and a half million. So you know, when, how you get involved, you know, will depend on what your resources are, what your risk factors, your, your risk adventure you would like to take. Some people are very adventurous and like to take big risks and others don't. So yeah, start out small and go from there. I, I want to mention that you and I met on a panel discussion that was put on by Zach Bush, MD, who is also someone that we've interviewed here at Sustainability Now. You can find his really wonderful interview on our website. And he is also a big champion of regenerative agriculture and is leading a movement called Farmer's Footprint. We'll make sure to make the uh, URL for that available as well. So. Bob, I want to say thank you. This has been great. I'm wondering if you, if there's anything I should have asked you that I didn't ask you. Yes. Uh, anybody that's listening to this and if they're not farmers or entrepreneurs that want to get involved in the CANAF industry, there's one thing that you can do for all of us here on planet Earth, 
And that is to know what CANAF is and let others know. We want to make that a household word because it has the potential of changing our world in a big way. If we do it in a well-organized way and not just me, but others like yourself and Zach Bush and so forth, see the vision and see the potential with it. Beautiful. And do you have any resources that you could recommend? Any books besides, well, you have the two books that you've published, which is awesome. And we'll direct people to those. But are there any other resources that you'd recommend? Um, in... In terms of books or movies or... For CANAF? Mm -hmm. Oh. And maybe even for regenerative arc, uh, uh, agriculture. Yeah, uh, Mark Shepard's book, Regenerative, called Regenerative Agriculture, is a good one. Um, if you want to learn about carbon farming, Eric Tones Meyer has a good one on carbon farming. Most people at this particular point would be interested in growing food and gardens. I think everybody, including school kids, should uh, get trained in permaculture. Period. Yeah. It's just a way of thinking. Uh, when I was working with Kareen uh, for a period of two years, she, our students were anywhere from eight years old to uh, 70 some years old. So say and who say who Kareen is. Kareen Brennan, she's the founder of Grow Permaculture. She's a permaculture instructor, uh, and uh, she has a farm in Brooksville. She does consulting. She works on Pine Ridge, uh, and uh, with Brian Deans on the reservation there, and has done wonderful work uh, in Haiti and California and on the reservation and all over the place. She's just uh, 24 seven permaculture lady. And, and I, I have to recommend her as an instructor in permaculture because based on what I personally observe, her students have the highest uh, success rate in full-time uh, careers after doing her course along their purpose line. Beautiful. Yeah. That's great resource. We'll, we'll make sure to post her link as well. Nope. And is there anything else that I missed that you'd like to fill in before we wrap up today? Just to let you know, any book, uh, digital book that you purchase uh, from Canap Partners USA, and there's uh, 99 cents for a digital book, to find out about Canap, the money that is earned from that goes into regenerative practices. And um, I did want to say something about uh, Zach Bush and Farmer's Footprint because their, their goal is big uh, and I love that. And we are very much in alignment with that. We want to contribute to it. They want to, they, they had an original uh, goal of turning 5 million acres into carbon sequestration and, and diverse, you know, cover crops and so on and so forth and really do some stuff with the soil. Within the next five years, I think. Yeah. And then recently he had said, that's not nearly enough. We have to have, we, if, if you think you're thinking too big, you're not. <laughs> think big, you know, if you don't make the big one, if you fall halfway between, men, you're going to be doing a lot better than if you think small. Yeah. So that's my closing statement for today. Beautiful. I want to thank you so much, Bob. It's been a delight to have you here. And you've uh, educated me. And I appreciate it. Now I have a whole new uh, horizon to be entertaining about CANAF. And for all of you who are listening, I want to say thank you. Uh, we have Thursday night hangouts, so be sure to join our mailing list so you get notifications on these hangouts on Thursday night at 7 p.m. Eastern. We're showing movies and having wonderful international conversations and uh, about relevant topics, obviously. 
And it's also a wonderful way during these times of isolation for us to be connecting and broadening our sense of community. And I want to thank our producer, Scott Billy, um, my co-founder. And just to say that's it for today. Live your best life. Love the world around you. And together we can save the world. Thank you for listening to Sustainability Now. Visit sustainabilitynow.global to find resources related to today's program. While you're there, pledge your support by making a contribution to help us shape a world that works. And remember to subscribe, share, and follow us on social media.